So this is an important component of, um, of your work, because you all work in teams. I know there are a few uh, clinicians in the room. If I may approach one, if you put your hand up. What I'm trying to get to is understand how will you actually get your colleagues in the practice working on CQI and quality improvement. <laughs> You're obviously here because you, at, at, at the stage of, I'm happy with it, I think it's achievable, I think I'd like to do this in my practice. But there might be other clinicians in the room, in your practice, that are not as engaged. So I just want to get a feel from a physician in the room, how they think they might actually go about engaging the not so engaged general practitioners. And, yeah. If you don't mind, just share some of your ideas. Just, I'm just curious. It's pretty hard. <laughs> we have been trying to do this recently. We have got a group of older doctors who are pretty busy. Their books are full. They, yes, they look after the patients, but a lot of things we haven't done. The, 70, the health assessments, diabetes cycle of care, the COPD, the care plans. So we did pull out, uh, through the PEMCAT thing, we pulled out a list of the patients. And I engaged a nurse to do the recalls. It's hard to difficult the older patients back yeah, yeah. for the health assessments and the care plans. So we did try, and it has worked to some extent, <coughs> but it's difficult. So did you share that with the other clinicians in the practice to say look at what we're trying to do? Yes, some of them were interested. Okay. One of them said, okay, yes, I'm happy with this. You can just involve the nurse and get them to do the recalls, while some of them, others, were not keen. Yes, and, and that is very challenging. Uh, you know, that's something we face through the whole collaboratives, is trying to get, you know, uh, lead clinicians or clinicians in, in large practices engaged from get-go. Anyone else? Would you like to share something? Financially incentivize the doctors. So if your PIP is worth twelve and a half thousand per quarter, then <laughs> when you do your um, goal, give each doctor um, say our goal this month is to do X and run the checks through PENCAT by provider and see whether they've achieved X, and then um, divide the twelve and a half thousand by those that have achieved X. I think that's a great idea, and that was actually something that came out of another session we ran. The general practitioner said, yeah, you know, we really need to look, restructure the way we um, encourage other GPs to be engaged, and finance might be a way to do that. Another practitioner said um, what he does in his practice, because he's really into the data, is that he will print out the list of uh, general practitioners who are not coding accurately, and name them at a team meeting. <laughs> but he does it tactfully, and he does it in a way to say, look, you know, we really need to improve this. You know, we're, we're failing here, we need to improve that. Another one said that they would actually look at the waiting times of some of the practitioners, and uh, in the team meeting address that, and say, look, you know, you, it's just taking too long um, for your patients to see you. How can we reduce that? There's some ideas. I mean, any any other ideas? I know because it, it is a very challenging thing to take a concept like you know we've we've talked to you about what quality improvement is. We've said systems thinkers. We've talked about measurement. We've said you know you can do all of these lovely things, but when you go back into your practice and you then have to try and embed this thinking, it's not easy because you might have an enthusiastic team meeting on Monday. And one goes, that sounds fantastic. Tuesday, they go, what? <laughs> I don't have time. You are interested. You go ahead and do it. So it's really thinking about how we embed this in a way that's going to be sustainable. So it's, it's, it's an important part of our discussion. And we try to keep this interesting. I don't want to be here talking about good communication skills and listening skills and stuff like that. Because I mean, all of that we know, we understand. We're all mature adults. Uh, we've, we've come to various different conferences and, and um, workshops. What we want to do is try and give you some tools that you can take away with. So really love to hear from you. 
as to what you think you're going to be able to do and how you're going to approach this, because it is very important. So the reasons why people are engaged in any kind of change is they need to feel like they've, you know, they're valued, so their values are supported in this change. So what's important to me, what's important to you could be very different. So it's recognizing and validating that. So that's why defining the goal and understanding what the practice is working towards is important. Um, they think the change is worth it. So another thing that the clinician said in the other session was that if it's actually about improving the care of my patients, I'm in. And then the second bit was that, yeah, I need to be reimbursed financially for it as well, but if I know it's going to improve the care of my patients, I'm in. They think it's important. They think they're actually ready for it. So, so the practice needs to be ready for this. And, and who can help you with that? Your PHN. They can give you some pointers on how to actually get your practice to a point where they actually feel they've got the right systems in place, at least, to look at their data, or at least to have that conversation. They believe that they can, uh, they need to take charge. So I guess in that sense, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the PDSA cycle and you're allocating a task to someone, be mindful that that person needs to feel like they can actually accomplish that task. Don't give them something where they've got a big barrier in front of them because they need to go through a clinician to get to get to the data to try and get that job done. I'm going to open some doors so it makes it easy for them. They get frequent reminders about resources and try to make it fun. So, so an example, and I think um, at one of the other sessions, uh, another colleague of ours from IF, she explained an example where what they did was they had a goal that they were working towards, but she made it into a horse racing. Kate, if you, if you, you might just let me, yeah, just explain that, that game that they did because I think that was a really great way that Katie actually got the team involved. So this is um, one of the Improved Foundation consultants. I'm not on the spot again. Um, example as to how to engage the clinicians in the practice. So she basically got a whole load of little horse heads in different colours and got each GP in the practice to choose a horse head. And it was about uploading health summaries, I think. Um, and she basically had the month uh, going across, so dates in the month, and each horse head had a line. So she checked it every day and moved the horse head along the line, <laughs> depending on how many health summaries each GP had uploaded, and they had a race, and they got very competitive, and it worked really well. And they had a little prize at the end. So fantastic, fun idea to encourage that engagement. Yeah. Thank you. It does require a bit of investment and time for someone to actually monitor that, but a great way to get everyone involved. And from our experience, general practitioners do get very competitive. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you're nodding your head, that's true. And, and that's absolutely fine. So tap into where you think you're going to be able to get some traction. So some of the strategies, I guess, is to tailor your message, have a very effective, clear communication mechanism. You know, you could use a number of modes, you know, besides standing at team meetings and talking about this. You could do, do games like that. Put something up on your, on, from a, on your notice board. Engage them in every way, shape, or form where they're constantly thinking about quality improvement, wherever possible. Persuasive techniques. What's in it for me framework? So important. If someone doesn't feel they're going to get something out of it, they're probably unlikely to get involved, especially in a very dynamic environment such as this. So I might reach out to the gentleman sitting in the back. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Now, I know that you said that you work in different types of practices, and one of them is an IPN. And we talked about how each one might be very different. So, you know, you have a situation where you've got some practices where you've got a group of people uh, at a very top level making decisions. Would that be correct? And then you've got, it, you've got another environment where you've got practitioners who are engaged, trying to make some level of change as well. So how you would respond to these two different groups is important. So if you're working in an environment where you need to get the buy-in of someone on the top end, it's the way you would actually get them engaged. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and how you'd actually talk to them, how you'd convince them to agree with you and support you in this journey. I'm assuming that most practices who are IPN and signed up for the PIP are financially driven as well, and they'll want to make sure that that money comes through. So there's all, it's always, you're always thinking, thinking of different things to help you get this message across and supportive. So rules for engaging clinicians, we talked about some of them, 
Um, the one that I, I found interesting was the last one here, Academic Keys for QI. Um, in another hatch, I sort of work with Healthcare Homes model, the, tri the trial that's being run. And a lot of the physicians who are in that trial really wanted to see some international examples of what's happening in other countries around change that they're doing that they could use in Australia. So sometimes even sort of demonstrating the evidence base around some of the things that you're talking about could add value. Change and transition. It's important to understand the two, the differences here between the two. So change is situational. So change, for example, is that as of the 1st of August, PQI is on board. There's nothing you can do about it. It's actually being implemented. That's a change. The transition bit is actually the psychology behind it. Not everyone in the practice is ready for that level of change. Not everyone is looking at it from the point of view, let's go, let's go, let's go. Some of us don't like change, don't deal with change very well. So understanding your team members and how they respond to change is important, especially if you're taking that lead role and trying to sort of bring the team along. There's a model called the Bridges model. And this is, it's important, we thought we'll put this in just to, to draw attention to the three areas here. The ending and the letting go, the neutral zone, and the new beginning. A lot of the time, as professionals, I think we're wired to think about the new beginning. We kind of go, okay, next, what are we doing? How are we gonna get there? Let's move forward, guys, come on. We've got to now start using computers. Great, now we've got to start using pen. Now we've got to start looking at data properly. And we fail to look at the ending. So it's important to recognize that and to empathize and communicate and educate. Because for a very long time, we've been doing something a certain way and it's worked, but now we've got something else we need to do. So for those individuals who are part of a team who are not quite ready yet to make that change, recognizing and validating that part of the ending is important. So they don't feel like they've been told that's just how it is, just come on board, but to recognize that this change is hard for them. And then sitting in the neutral zone, allowing that to happen, and then celebrating and, and, and embarking and rewarding the new beginning. We just want to draw attention to that because sometimes that gets mi missed in, in this challenging environment and, and dynamic environment that we work in. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs, but sometimes he feels there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. We put that in because we felt it's very important to think about protected time. So I'm standing here babbling on about how important it is to think about change and transition and think about how you're going to engage people. Don't forget that if you're allocated a task, give them protected time to work in it. Allow them the space, the head space, to think about what they're trying to achieve, how will they measure it, and what are they actually going to do. Really important. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a task ahead of us. And this is us trying to use one of the quality improvement tools, which is the uh, force field analysis, the last one that Colin talked about. So the challenge is very much aligned to the PIPQI. You've got four general, sorry, seven GPs, two PAs, nurses, one practice manager, and an administration officer. And this is table by table. The practice is registered with PIPQI. One GP has been delegated the responsibility by the owners to ensure that the practice meets the requirements. The GP has enlisted the support of the PM. Data quality at the, at the practice is questionable and generally there's a lack of QI understanding. So at your table, and Colin's coming around with post-it notes, what we want you to do is using four post-it notes, we want you to write four driving forces that will support the PIP QI being enlisted or, or engaged in, and four restraining forces that you can see that's going to work against you convincing the team to come on board. So just use one to describe one. Don't list four and one post-it note, in other words. 
Does that make sense? So just going to spend a few few moments there to just pen those down. So we've we've kind of gone through some of them. But if you think of anything new, please pen them down. Then we're going to try and use affinity to group them. Yeah. Any questions about the task? You've got six minutes. All right. So we're just bringing these together with affinity, and uh, there's some common common uh, themes here. We've got certainly we've got on the driving forces. We've got financial incentives as being, you know, listed up here. We've got improved patient outcomes as being another driving force. We've got team or job satisfaction as a driving force. So on the restraining side, we've got um, lack of lack of commitment or poor participation. We've got a resistance to change across the team generally. So whether it's the uh, you know uh, clinical side, the admin side, just resistance and fear of change. Interestingly, there's one, there's a couple here around um, lack of patient engagement or um, or patient non-compliance. I love that word, patient non-compliance. I mean, they just won't do what they're told. It's unbelievable. Really, it's their fault. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got um, lack, lack of commitment, which, and there's another one there about uh, poor participation, including poor participation, so just lack of commitment's fine. Um, GP, we've got resistance to change, okay, across the team, so resistance to change, and or fear of change. We've got data quality, is uh, one. We've got patient um, engagement, or lack of patient engagement, We've got general resources and time, mm -hmm. I think is a key one. Uh, lack of understanding of QI or skilling QI. Lack of understanding of just put off QI. We've also got one here which is an interesting one that's come up, is, is clinical team uh, part-timers. Okay, part-timers. Which would clearly make it a bit hard. And I've got an orphan down here of maintaining consistency. So that is a restraining force. That might, is that, was that intended more so like, for data quality or? So like starting something and not following it through. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so the lack of commitment. Lack of consistency. Yeah. Lack of commitment. That can go under lack, lack of commitment. commitment. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So when we look at financial reward, 95% of people have said, yeah. Look, that's, that's got a tick, there's no doubt about it. It's, one of the, it's the highest one. Improved patient outcomes is the second highest, at 79%. Okay? Improved teamwork and satisfaction, 34. Clean data, 37. Medico legal drivers is, uh, is eight. Accreditation is, is 26. Reducing cost, and, uh, reducing cost and less waste is 11. Motivated owners is five. And promoting practice, uh, Promoting practices of QI practices five percent. So if you look at if you take that into into account, the, those top two, the really the financial drivers and the improvement of patient care, you're sort of not going to get much more leverage out of that because they're already really quite strong. But when you come down the list, then things like even the medico legal drivers, which seems to be quite underdone at the moment, so. For clinicians working, you know, professionally in practice, I mean, medical legal issues are, you know, they're clearly there, and we're moving into a more litigious sort of environment. Um, and that's to me one that you could probably just through promotion of the benefits of this say, well, actually, this is going to help you with this. That actually also then leads on to adverse events, uh, even things like, uh, you know, if you're actually running a very good quality practice with low, uh, you know, events and those sort of things, you, you you present yourself as a better proposition for insurance. So those are the things where you say, well, what can we do then to promote the benefits of these that people don't quite see them at the moment and get those up higher? Because if they come up higher, you end up with a greater weight behind you to get it done. So the top two here are standouts are resistance to change and poor data quality uh, and lack of time and resources and, and uh, the time. They're the top three by, by far. And then it drops away a little bit down to lack of understanding QI. Um, and no financial rewards for GPs, etc., uh, as as less. But as an example, the, the resistance to change and the poor data quality, those sort of things. If that's what's saying dragging, holding people back, 
then you can clearly put in place, uh, you know, sort of a communication and support for the team to say, well, actually, um, the uh, you know data quality, uh, we've got a we've got a plan to improve that. You know, we have a way forward now because we're going to put in place a process for making sure our data, you know, are in fact complete, accurate, and up to date and timely, and we're not going to have a problem with data quality and try to you know get that sell across to the team um, and. In issues with, say, lack of resources and time, now that's clearly going to be a problem. And one of the best ways around that is for the, you know, for the business to say, we're going to provide uh, the, uh, the project team, the quality team here with some protected time. And you're going to have a couple of hours every fortnight you know, to work on small incremental changes and come back to the team with what, what, you, what, what you would like them to implement. And if you actually get that commitment, well, then that's going to reduce that that, uh, that uh, restraining force, because people are like, we can see a commitment. We've got actually people with some protected time to do something. So unless they, but if you're not going to do anything about those driving forces and those restraining forces, at the moment the restraining forces will win, and the driving forces, whilst they might be, you know, financials, you know, quite strong, and the uh, uh, and the patient outcomes is quite strong. Uh, you know, they're not going to get you over the line by themselves because that's how it currently is. They're very strong driving forces and unlikely to change much. So this is an example of how you'd use that activity with, say, your small team to implement. Say, here's our challenge. Over the next year, what, what are we going to do? And your first steps would be to say, well, let's get some foundation work around some of those, uh, you know, reducing those uh, barriers to change. Uh, and getting those driving forces up as far as possible so that the team is better in a better position to move forward. 